Thank you. Everyone knows a pastor can't preach without a pulpit. <laughs> um, just a couple things that you're probably aware of, uh, but I want to bring you up to speed on, and that is that when we gathered last Sunday, um, my father-in-law was in reasonably good health. Yesterday, our, our family gathered uh, to remember him, to say our last goodbyes to him, and uh, to uh, have his funeral service. And so we're reminded how, how brief life can be and how sudden things can change. And this is something I want you to know this morning. It was good for me to be in this house hearing you lift your voice to our Savior. It lifts my spirits to hear that. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Second thing I want to make you aware of is that uh, tomorrow uh, I'm actually scheduled for um, bilateral knee replacement. And if you don't know what that means, it means they're going to replace both of my knees at the same time. And uh, I've tried for uh, quite a few years uh, to hide how uh, difficult it is for me to walk and stand. If you see me not standing during worship, it is not because pastors only stand when we preach. <laughs> it's because uh, that's actually a difficult thing for me to do these days. And so, um, so I will be a few weeks out of here in recovery process. But as we saw uh, last February, we've got some phenomenal people around here to bring God's word. Isn't that true? It really is. And while this is the last uh, uh, message in the series on worship, I, I hope it's not the last time we worship, like that should be ongoing. There is an eye in worship. Psalm 63 says this, you God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing, my mouth will praise you. And then one other verse of scripture is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. It says, therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Because in our world, when people lift up hands, it usually has to do with, with anger. Uh, real worship requires a real response. Real worship requires a real response. There are some people who are more verbal. You probably have someone in your family that just abhors a vacuum of silence, and if anyone's not talking, they'll kind of fill it in. You probably have some people in the family, maybe you're like them, who you have less to say, or you maybe think of a lot of things, but you're unwilling to share as many of those things. And so you feel a little bit less verbal. There is something called nonverbal communication, and it can accompany what we're saying, or it can be on its own. And it's our body posture, it's our body language. And, uh, and it communicates a lot of things as well. Virtual worship in our culture, uh, we kind of define it as uh, uh, tuning in uh, digitally to some other environment where people are engaged in worship. And so that, that's what constitutes this virtual worship. But virtual worship is really anytime we have a mental image but no physical response. Nothing is happening externally. Watching others worship but not participating. Um, watching because there's something that's intriguing about what's happening. And so we're externally we're interested in but internally we're inhibited so we kind of enjoy seeing other people engage in worship but we feel a little self-conscious when we do it and this is very important all right this might surprise you the reason we are inhibited in worship has to do with what's happening inside 
not outside. It's an internal thing. We have a tendency to want to preserve ourselves and to preserve our dignity. We don't like to appear to be naive people or gullible people or easily controlled people. So the truth is, is that we do respond to what is real. So let's say this morning that I were to walk up to you and I were to reach into my pocket and I was going to, I pulled out a $100 bill and I said, I would like to give this to you. How many of you would just stand there with your hands locked at your side and say, I would really love to receive that, but I'm a little self-conscious, and so could you just put that in my pocket for me? Like, we wouldn't do that, right? Uh, if I said that, some people, I wouldn't finish the sentence. they just seen the $100 bill. They would, they would grab it, and other, every one of us would respond. If you were standing on the other end of this stage, and I said, I'm going to throw a ball to you, and I want you to catch it, if I threw the ball, you would actually position yourself to catch it. No one here would go, I'm not sure the ball is real. And I don't want to appear foolish and just stand there and let it hit you in the face. Like, nobody would do that. We kind of understand that when something is real, we actually respond to it. If I were to tell you I'm going to physically push you, you would either position your body to resist being pushed or to maintain your balance while you're being pushed because you believe that that is real. Here's what you need to understand. We always, we always, we always respond to what we actually believe. Anytime you want to know what people believe, their response is based on something they believe. Every time. In every area of their life. Humans are terrifyingly consistent about this. We act on what we believe. So that brings us back to this passage, because David, who's the second king of Israel, is looking for word pictures to help him describe his understanding of God and God's dealings with him. And, and he's something of a poet. He's a, he's a creative personality. He writes music and he writes poetry. And on this occasion, he actually happens to be in the desert of Judah. Deserts are, by and large, uh, hot places in the daytime. And there's not a lot of water available. There's not a lot of fruit available. There's not a lot of, of food that you have access to. And you get really thirsty in a desert because there's not a lot of water. And you kind of dehydrate more quickly there. And so... So he understands, he's starting to feel thirsty, and he's kind of paying attention to what's happening to him. And he doesn't just go from feeling a little thirsty to staying that way. He, he gets even more thirsty and more thirsty until, until it feels like this is a craving. Like, I, I really need to access some water right now. In fact, his whole being, it's not just his mouth feels dry. If you get thirsty enough, your whole being craves water. And David makes the connection. He's always looking for word pictures to understand and describe a spiritual truth. And there's a concept, there's a connection between his longing for water and his longing for God. And what he realizes is, it's not just a taste thing. My whole being craves the living God. Now, there's a, a common question that I will get asked by people who kind of struggle with expressive worship, and that is, can't I worship God in my heart? And, and so the answer is, well, of course you can, but that's not the real question you're asking. The real question is, can I worship God with only my heart? That is a very different question. So I have a question for that question. Why would you want to worship with only part of your being? All of God is worthy to be worshiped by all of us. Every part of our being. Now here's something, somebody said, well, I don't know, what difference does it actually make? And here's something I want to try to explain. I'm gonna do the best I can. It's, it's not easy, but I'm gonna try really hard. And that is a spiritual thing is real whether we, we respond to that or not. God doesn't become unreal if we re refuse to respond to him in any way. But the way that spiritual things kind of are brought into our physical lives is through our response. 
Something has to happen. I can give you an example of this. Salvation was not possible until God, who is spirit, took on flesh. Uh, John, the first chapter says, and the word became flesh and we and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If Jesus had not physically responded to our sin need, we would still be lost. We just celebrated the Lord's table in a physical way, by the way, because God physically addressed our sin issue. Thinking about rescuing somebody is not the same thing as rescuing them. And thinking about God is not the same thing as worshiping him. And here's the thing. You don't have to respond. It doesn't make God any less, but it will make your experience of God less. You don't have to respond. God will not be any less. But our lack of response makes our experience of God less. There are things that God actually desires to release into our lives. And in worship, we're not trying to get what we want from God. In worship, what we're trying to get is what he wants for us. God actually wants better things for us than we want for ourselves. So, and we don't worship with all of our being just because it's expected or just because someone said so. The reason we worship God with all of our being is because it's biblical. This is what scripture teaches. Worship is not about us, it's about Jesus. And when we are worried about how we will look or what others will think, we've turned worship into something about us instead of about him. Worship is an expression of our joy and an exercise of our faith. I'd like us all to repeat that out loud and together. Worship is an expression of our joy and an exercise of our faith. And our faith, when we exercise it, it activates us. This is what it tells us in James, the second chapter, the 19th verse. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Then look at this. But do you want to know, oh foolish man? Do you want to know? Faith without works is dead. Faith activates, it animates. Worship of our God is not based on how I feel, Worship of our God is based on who he is. And God doesn't change. I am thrilled that God doesn't have a bad day. I have them. You have them. He doesn't have any bad days. So what would you rather make the decisions in your life? Your faith in who God is or your feelings, how you feel today? So here's some common biblical responses in worship. And the first is clapping, clapping. Uh, when we clap, we're not just keeping time to the music, though we might be, and we're not just acknowledging the end of a song. Uh, uh, the song is over. We're supposed to clap now, right? It's, it's more than that. Psalm 47, verse 1 says, Clap your hands, all ye peoples. Clap your hands. Usually when people are clapping, it is something of an expression of joy. And here's, here's what we need to know. Joy is something that you feel, but rejoicing is a way to display that feeling. You make it visible, you make it audible, that people are aware. You can have joy and hide it, or you can express it, and rejoicing is making your joy visible. And, and in our world, when we see a celebrity, we clap. Uh, when we see dignitaries, we clap. When we see athletes, we clap. When we see politicians, well, if you see the one you like, you clap. If you see teachers, we clap. If you see first responders, we clap. If we see essential workers, we clap. Even in, in early days of COVID, when somebody came out of the hospital and they survived their COVID experience, the hospital staff would line the halls and they would clap. So let me ask you, what is it about God that is worth less than any of those individuals? 
We wouldn't think twice. You know, people who've worked so hard and so courageously to, to help get us through a very difficult season over the last year. And, and I have no doubt right now, if I asked people who worked in healthcare industry and first responders to stand in the room and they all stood, we would feel very comfortable just going, we are so grateful for all that you do to help us. And so why is it, why is it that when it comes to God, we feel more intimidated because he is not worth less? So let's just try something. Let's just give a clap of praise unto our God. Can we do that? All right, yes, yes. He's worthy of not just praise, but our highest praise. It's amazing. And then that same passage in Psalm 47, it doesn't just say clap your hands all you people, but shout to God with a voice of triumph. Shouting is an is a interesting thing to do, and we all do it, though rarely in church. Usually your kids or your spouse is involved, maybe a neighbor, possibly a sports team that may or may not be doing as you want. I really haven't tracked whether I shout more at a Bills game if they're winning or they're losing. I do know this, I do not sit in silence. <laughs> I've got something to say. Shouting is something that expresses anticipated victory or it celebrates a victory that has occurred. What I've noticed is, is that when I go to a Bills game, the whole uh, uh, stadium does not sit on its hands and quietly until the end and then if we win, we shout. No, people start shouting when, pe when, the, when the athletes, the football players come onto the, the field. Like we start shouting down and then there's a play and we shout then and, and if the other team makes a play and, and we don't like that, that's when we get quiet. We get quiet. Um, they shout from the beginning. Even at the, there's a great story in the Bible uh, about the first conquest of a city when the nation of Israel went into the promised land, and, and it's Jericho. And uh, God told him, he said, I want you to go around this, the city once a day, every day for six days, and on the seventh day, go around the city seven times and, then, and be really quiet the whole time, and then when, we, when you get to the, the seventh lap on the seventh day, I want you to shout, and, and they also had some, some instruments, and just lift up those instruments and make a joyful noise, and when they did that, the walls came down, which which some people think that what I'm saying is, is that when you shout, that's what makes victory happen. Shouting anticipates victory and shouting celebrates victory. It's obedience that makes victory happen. It's obedience. And so shouting, uh, since we clap, let's just try a quick brief shout. There's a word that's universally known in every language. The word is hallelujah. And so let's just, on three, lift a shout. Like louder than you would yell at your kids or someone you don't like. Let's, let's lift a shout of praise to God, all right? One, two, three. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. And we can, we can lift our voice because we believe God is going to do good things or if he has done good things to celebrate what he has done. How many are glad we can celebrate the good things of God with our voice? We absolutely can. And then singing. Sing to the Lord a new song. Now, it doesn't mean every time it has to be a new song, but some people think that any song written uh, in less than 100 years ago doesn't count as a real song. <laughs> and, and I understand some of that. But sing to the Lord a new song and sing to the Lord all the earth and sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Oh, we don't just sing once, from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the people. This is what I know, is singing helps to drive deep truths into your heart. Does it ever happen to you? I'll be here on a Sunday and a worship song will get stuck in my head. And, and I'll find myself, I'll be driving down the road or doing some chore at home and I'll just be going, singing hallelujah. And I go, oh, why is that in my head? Oh, that's right, we sang that on Sunday and something's being pressed, it's moving from my head and into my heart. 
Something's being captured in the rest of my being. Singing actually helps us remember things. Singing encourages others who may be unable to sing because of the burdens that they carry today. Singing can actually be a prayer for someone else. We can lift our voice in singing. And then there's this one. By the way, this is not an exhaustive list. I don't have time for that message and you don't have the patience for it. So I just picked a bunch of most popular ones. This one's not popular, but I put it in here just to challenge us a little bit today. Right? Bowing down and kneeling. Psalm 95, verse 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and, what's the words? Bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is God. We are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Bowing and kneeling shows a kind of submission to God's authority, and uh, if, if you remember the gifts of the wise men when they came to the, the child Jesus, uh, we all remember that they gave three gifts, gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, but there's actually another gift that they gave, and no one ever preaches about that. And it says that they bowed down and they worshiped him. And sometimes it's easier to give resources than it is to bow down and worship. Now, what I will tell you is, is that this is not a typical American response. In fact, Americans kind of pride ourselves in not bowing down to anybody. And Scripture challenges us, and I'm going to challenge you. So what's more important to you, American culture or biblical worship? If we follow the American culture, not only will we not participate in worship when we are present, but we will find other things to do on the Lord's Day. That's just the way our culture rolls. So what's going to drive us? Is it going to be God and scripture or the culture in which we live? And then uh, lifting hands. Psalm 134 says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. I'm so glad I don't have to wait to get to heaven to participate in worship. I know worship is going on there, but there's this wonderful connection between heaven and earth when we lift our voice and we lift our hands in worship. So why wait? We don't want to do that. And it says, this is really interesting, it says, in the sanctuary. So some people, this is what a lot of people tell me, well, I, I worship privately, I, I don't do this publicly. And here's what I, I've been doing ministry a long time. This is what I've observed. People do not do in private what they do not do in public. I do not believe that there are people who are kind of stoic in a worship service that when they're home and they're engaged in private worship, it's kind of like an interpretive dance and hands up, voice out, just dancing all over the house like they're, they're going. And then when they get to church, it's like this. That's not usually how that goes. We are to lift our hands publicly in worship. When we do that, we acknowledge good things about God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Worship is an expression of our joy. It's an exercise of our faith. When we want to be our world to be influenced by God, we lift our voice. It all starts by what we're willing to say. We learn this from God himself. God didn't just have ideas about creation. He made it all possible with the words that came out of his mouth. Let there be. And God spoke and his thoughts became reality. There's no shortage of words in our world today that unleash fear and frustration. We all feel it and we can tell. But what if we were willing to use our words to unlock something holy in our lives and in our world. That can happen when we're willing to worship. So I believe God's the most generous being in the universe, and I believe he came prepared today to give us amazing gifts. And I'm wondering if we're willing to receive them. I think that there are challenges that we are facing 
And we've only heard one side of what's possible in our world, but if we're willing to lift our voice and praise to God, we can hear what heaven's side of things thinks about what's happening in our world and what can be done about it rather than just complaining about it. I want to find out what God wants to do in my life. I want to find out what God wants to do in our world. And the way that happens is when we present ourselves in his presence, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise. We use our voice to bless his name. And with hands lifted high, we see what God is willing to pour into our lives. How many would like to experience something of that for yourself today? Amen? Amen? Let's all stand to our feet. Let's lift our voice. Let's lift our hands and let's worship him this morning.